One of the most bonkers events to affect the global economy was the ever giving cargo ship that got stuck in the Suez Canal, where 15% of global shipping goes through. It reminded me just how colossal these cargo ships are, but it also made me think, how on earth will we ever decarbonize these giant pieces of engineering? Globally, transport contributes to 23% of all carbon emissions, with road transport making up 74% of these emissions, while shipping and aviation contribute 22%. For road transport, battery electric and hydrogen fuel cells are becoming the common strategy for decarbonization. But for shipping and aviation, batteries are too heavy, while hydrogen being a gas makes its practicality challenging. But what if in the first place we never had to replace liquid fuels? and could make our current fossil fuel options sustainable. Does this option already exist? And if so, how feasible is it? Currently, fossil fuels are taken out of the ground before being combusted in a mode of transport, thereby reducing CO2. Electrofuels, or e-fuels, are similar, but instead, they are synthesized by storing electrical energy into chemical bonds. Their production starts with renewable energy that first powers electrolysis, a process that uses electrodes and a proton exchange membrane to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. Next, we have direct air capture, which sucks CO2 out of the atmosphere. This process uses large fans to pull air in. The air passes through alkaline materials, such as potassium hydroxide, which trap the CO2 in a carbonate salt solution. The carbonate ions can then be pelletized by reacting them with calcium and the pellets can then be heated to release and store the CO2. The hydrogen from electrolysis is then combined with the CO2 to form hydrocarbons by the Fischer-Trope process. And there we have an e-fuel ready for use. While upon combustion CO2 is still released, as it was initially sucked in from the air, there are no net emissions, rendering the term carbon neutral. However, in reality, there are still some emissions. E-fuel plants that run on wind power have a carbon capture efficiency of around 90%. This means that for every 1 kg of CO2 captured, 0.1 kg of CO2 are released. This CO2 comes from the upstream activities to actually build the e-fuel plant in addition to the chemicals used during operation. Now, given we are re-releasing that 1 kg of CO2 captured, the net impact would be plus 0.1 kg of CO2. Theoretically, this offers to decarbonize 90% of all combustion emissions, which is pretty good. But if e-fuels are so great from the environmental point of view, why have they been out of the transport spotlight? The economics of e-fuels does not look promising. For e-gasoline, the cost in 2030 is estimated to be $4 per litre. For perspective, conventional gasoline costs around $2 per litre, with aviation fuel well below that, and shipping bunker fuel costing basically nothing on the litre scale. So why are e-fuels so expensive? One reason is that direct air capture technology is not only expensive but energy intensive, requiring a lot of renewable energy. To visualise this challenge, let us look at a simple illustration. CO2 makes up only 0.04% of the air composition. This means to capture just one tonne of CO2 in a day, Direct air capture needs to process a minimum of 1.3 million cubic meters of air, which you guessed it, is energy intensive and expensive. This is what Carbon Engineering are doing in Squamish, Canada. In fact, they claim that if their technology were to be scaled, they can achieve a cost as low as $90 per tonne of CO2 captured, which could reduce the current direct air capture costs by 80%. This certainly helps the cost of e-fuels, but to achieve favorable economics, either their electricity costs would need to be heavily subsidized or fossil fuel prices will need to rise by potential carbon taxes. But both of these scenarios are difficult to predict. For the short term, e-fuels are likely to remain expensive and will require further innovation. There is, however, another concern over the supply of renewable energy. It's obvious that the world is in a great deficit of renewable energy, which will continue until at least 2050. This means that where renewable energy is available, it is to be prioritized for the most efficient decarbonization practices. 
For example, electricity that is generated by a wind turbine will retain 85% of the electricity during transmission and distribution. For an application such as a consumer appliance or an electric vehicle, this will convert 90% of the electricity into final use. Meaning, from the initial generation to the final use, 77% of the electricity would have been retained. Now for e-fuels, once the electricity is distributed to the e-fuel plant, after electrolysis, direct air capture and efficient trope process, about 58% of the initial energy is stored. Then, upon use in a ship engine, about 50% of the e-fuel energy is put into the final use. So by the final delivery, only 25% of the initial renewable energy generated is retained. This efficiency gap has made it difficult to sway policymakers towards the application of renewable energy towards e-fuels. And combined with the challenge in economics, this likely explains why e-fuels have received little spotlight for the time being. While this renewable deficit does not make e-fuels an instant priority, as we close the deficit in the next 20 and 30 years, I expect e-fuels will not only start to come into the spotlight, but would have made great advances in the efficiency of their production given it is still an emerging technology. But will they ever be able to meet the demands of shipping and aviation? The carbon engineering plant captures around 1 tonne of CO2 per day. For a ballpark estimate, that is around 340 litres of hydrocarbon fuel. Now, there are many different hydrocarbon fuels for different applications, so take these estimates with a grain of salt. Now, let's look at a shipping route from Rotterdam to Shanghai, which covers a distance of 90,000 kilometres. It takes a cargo ship around 24 days to complete the journey, consuming around 3 million litres of fuel. To supply a round trip, the e-fuel plant will need to capture nearly 18,000 tons of CO2. For a flight from Hong Kong to Shanghai in an Airbus A320, around 3,800 litres of fuel would be consumed. In this case, the e-fuel plant would need to capture around 22 tons of CO2 to supply a round trip. We can see that Carbon Engineering's e-fuel plant would need to be scaled quite considerably, but it is pretty unfair of me to use a pilot plant as an example. So let's go big. Porsche and Siemens are developing the Haro Oni e-fuel plant in Chile, which has set the ambitious target of producing 550 million litres of e-fuel a year from 2026. Globally, there are around 50,000 merchant ships which have an average travel distance of around 9,000 kilometres a year, estimating to a total fuel consumption of 63 billion litres. For aviation, there are around 40.3 million annual flights with an estimated total fuel consumption of 152 billion litres. The Haro Oni plant would be able to meet around 0.9% of the shipping demands or 0.4% of all aviation demands. These percentages may seem quite small, but considering this is coming from a single e-fuel mega plant, I think this is pretty impressive. To fully decarbonize all of current shipping and aviation, we would need to deploy nearly 400 of these e-fuel mega plants. This might seem like an unachievable number, but if we consider that over the last decades, we've been able to install 1,332 oil rigs and 700 oil refineries, and already have the infrastructure for hydrocarbon fuels, I think in the next 20 and 30 years, good progress could be made, given of course the economics and renewable deficit can be overcome. The first time I heard of e-fuels, I was skeptical at the idea of capturing carbon to only re-emit it back to the atmosphere. But I also realized that electrification and hydrogen can have some paralyzing limitations, especially in shipping and aviation. Despite the high costs and renewable deficit, the potential to decarbonize 90% of shipping and aviation should not be ignored. E-fuels are still emerging with many breakthroughs to come. I believe moving towards 2050 and beyond, they will become the last piece of the puzzle for decarbonizing transport and achieving sustainable mobility.